Um, I've been asked to, before uh, Nick starts, I've been asked to uh, mention that there are a few more, well, there is a short time left to prepare the panels for the ACA Salon. Um, and I just want to jog your memories and consciences uh, and to tell you that the panel is supposed to be in by March the 1st, 2nd or 3rd, isn't it? Right. Yes, so I hope we will all, I hope all of you will manage to get a panel together. Here is Nick Grimshaw to introduce Richard. Um, <coughs> well, uh, Richard said to me he's, he's not going to sort of go through uh, one building or a scheme or whatever, but wants to sort of try and raise a few uh, issues, provoke a bit of discussion and um, sort of get uh, uh, get people talking a bit. So, um, hopefully that's what he'll do. Um, I, I think that uh, that uh, what what uh, I would say about Richard is that he's he's got a component which is missing a lot from architecture these days, which is which is daring, and. I think that the one thing you can you can always say about the schemes he's done is that they they're always extremely daring and break a lot of a lot of new ground, both visually, technically, and in every other respect. And I think that's absolutely terrific. And people endlessly say, "Well, um, you know, how could he possibly try something like that?" But I mean, he's done it time and again, and he's <coughs> he's succeeded at it. And I think it's a lesson to everybody, really. And from the point of view of entering competitions and winning them with schemes which, uh, you know, maybe break all the rules or uh, are daring in many aspects which nobody would ever think of doing, um, he's sort of tried it. And I think that if there was more of that kind of spirit around, the, 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 the world would be a lot better place from an architectural point of view. The second thing I would say is that um, I think that the um, visual kind of richness and so on that uh, one sees in his buildings is a, a terrific lesson to uh, all the people these days who are trying to kind of claw back to the past and find <coughs> sort of references and so on, that you can actually provide the uh, a human quality or humanity in buildings um, without going back to the past at all. And I think that, that most people would say about the buildings and schemes he's done that they do uh, do a lot for people, both visually and uh, um, in terms of their actual use and activity within them. And, uh, I mean, it, everyone's seen Bobo, but the, the, uh, a lot of people kind of, it stirs up enormous feelings of love or hate, which is a great, a great thing in itself. But um, the one thing it, it does do is that it makes a terrific impact in, in, on the human scale in, in, in its setting. And uh, that is... Um, um, I think a great thing, and hopefully he's going to do the same for the City of London. Well, that's not really an introduction, but I think there's two th th there's two issues there which are worth uh, which are uh, perhaps worth maybe talking about later on. <laughs> I thought that um, I would try not to show the sort of a span of work, or even a single scheme, but to put up a few ideas and to try to establish some form of discussion. It seems to me that the difference between this uh, group here and the more normal lecture series of some hundreds um, is that you could actually start to talk here. And in one of my first uh, visits here, talking to Alison Smith, Smith, and she said, 
crummy. I know everybody's work. What do I want to see all their goddamn slides? All the words for that and third. Why can't we actually just see one slide or two slides and talk about it? Which I thought I was going to do, but of course I failed miserably because I came back at 5.30 and uh, so I had to get most of the usual slides up. But still, I cut a few up. And um, so what I'm going to do is to produce half a carousel in hope that it might stimulate some form of discussion as there is a modelly small group. Right. In a sense, that also relates to the whole, to my strong belief that architecture is rooted in ideological beliefs. Uh, they're obviously translated into, in, into form, and that it's not an image, a pure image that one's involved in, but actually in social political beliefs. How do I switch that thing on? The slides on. Thank you. <laughs> it also, it's also a, part, sort of a key belief that architecture goes beyond the client's brief and that the function of the internal function of the building is really only one part of architecture that architecture is related to as much as to the client it is also related to the passerby the major Part of this discussion is going to be related to cities and the fact that cities are for people, the sort of intervention of buildings within cities. On the right, as you will recognize, it's, is London. On the left, <coughs> the 1780 Nolly Plan for a Rome. On the Nolly Plan, the key element from, is the fact that the white background is public space. About a third of the areas is public. And public excludes in this plan here shopping. In other words, it's palaces, churches, piazzas, gardens, uh, and all uh, these sort of activities which public the public in that time of Rome had access to. And when I say that time, it's also related to today. What makes a city like Rome or Florence a great place to visit, a great place to still go, is in fact this tremendous public face, this relation to, the, to, to not only just the use of the building, but also in its internal function, but also to what it does to the city. On the right, I've marked what I've what could be considered to be the key points in London. Leicester Square, Piccadilly Circus, Trafalgar Square, Marble Arch, Hyde Park Corner, Parliament Square, Cambridge Circus, and so on. You can go on naming them. And these are the hubs of the city, once it's the hubs of a vast empire, and they really are all one thing, roundabouts, traffic roundabouts. And it seems that that's such a basic sort of uh, idea that the centres of cities should be roundabouts. And I, some of them, such as which I've, uh, Leicester Square, which is why it's semi-white, is still is a converted traffic roundabout, and it looks like it. Um, and one says, well, you know, surely the one thing that a city is meant to be is a meeting place for people. You can argue that everything else can be moved out of a city. You have new towns. You can move your industry out, you can move your um, housing, you can move, move anything, you can, your universities, everything except for one element. The one element you can't move out of the city is a meeting place, a, me a public meeting place. It's a place where people have the maximum social intercourse with other people. That's the only, probably the only thing that I can think of which you can't move out of, out of a city. And therefore, if we presume that, in fact, the city isn't for traffic and it isn't for purely for getting from A to B by car, then one obviously starts to question what are cities and what are buildings? What is the role that buildings play within that city? How can buildings interact like 
like the theatre interacts with the people, like the stage interacts with the people, surely buildings interact with the people who pass by. I'm not going to discuss in any great detail the internal function. I'm going to talk principally about the external function. Michelangelo's capital in Rome on the right is probably the best uh, conversion job that I can think of at an urban scale. There it is as it was on the left, basically a farmyard and a, uh, and, uh, a mud heap converted into a fantastic view, a tremendous social statement. A view across Rome, arcades, shelter, a feeling of place. London on the, on the right, Nash, again a recognition that large-scale planning does pay off. It isn't all the weaving in of pseudo bits and pieces, which, which obviously, you know, there's no battle about it, but there's also no excitement about it. Uh, Nash is a fantastic set statement. Today would be called two miles of Hadrian's Wall or something, but anyhow, in planning terms. This is just because I've just come back from Coin Street, but anyhow. <laughs> Uh, obviously, it's an it, would, it would be an impossibility to build anything of this sort. And what it also does, and what it does today still, is that even though there's practically none of Nash's buildings left, Regent Street is still a great road. In other words, the space that is defined by Nash is actually more important than the buildings that define it. I think this is a very important uh, and somewhat forgotten point, the curve and the way that your eye and your feet are led from point to point, from church to curve to circus and so on. This route is of immense importance, even with the pretty dilapidated buildings that we often have along it. It also takes another point, which is that it says the ground, and I shall again come back to this, the ground is for the people. It is shops, it's arcades, and above it, in this situation, is offices. And what's wrong with offices? It's not Offices are not wrong any more than factories are wrong. It's where we place them. It's the way they break the public realm, the realm which is a ground level. And there's continu continuous realms in key places, in key places and in areas which really should belong to the public because of their importance, <coughs> which have suddenly been broken up by less or more beautiful office buildings, slamming into the ground, breaking the public continuity, ruining the, the scene between the passerby and the user of that building. Obviously, the classic thing here, facing from the Tate, uh, straight across in view of the Houses of Parliament, is that wonderful development of our greatest river. And when I put this on, usually when I put this on abroad, they all say, is that Moscow, is it Warsaw, or where? <laughs> and it is an unbelievable wastage. I mean, talking about wastage of energy, uh, this, the waste of this energy is something which I think is stunning. It's not just related, obviously, to the, to the less or more better quality of the building, but also the fact that this is the Thames. I mean, it's the, one of the great rivers in the world. And who the hell uses it except in this sort of terms? To touch on Lloyd's, the Sir Edwin Cooper's gold medal, medalist Lloyd's uh, on the right, one of the, though the building itself has and did certain, certain urban qualities, one of the things that it did is it started an erosion in this area, or what was, or used to be, a shopping area leading to Leadenhall Market. And in doing that, in my opinion, is something which is typical, and is still going on today, which is, it is freezing the ground so that slowly Leadenhall Market is dying, not slowly, quite quickly it's dying, partly because there is no link to it. And on your left you have another of those great office buildings, which again, never mind the aesthetics of it, well, I mind the aesthetics, but anyhow, uh, but again, freezes the ground with a service yard, you know, some rubbish and so on. And so you have this thoroughest little market, totally isolated, and obviously beginning to become a sort of corner shop situation rather than the sort of market that it should be. Lloyd's itself, um, which started as a coffee house activity, a meeting of merchant, banker, and, um, and, and, and cargo, uh, shipping uh, magnets over a, a coffee has become this large market which now buys and sells insurance. But doesn't, actually, the activity is very little difference to buying and selling oranges and lemons, uh, or fish oil and poultry, as in that market there. 
But the food activity is still a very key one. In fact, the, they still call it the captain's room. It's the strange thing now in the new Lloyds, uh, the new Lloyds being the 1958 Lloyds, what we call the new Lloyds. This is the fourth Lloyds. This will be the fourth Lloyds of the century, which they have built each one to be the final Lloyds. Um, the new, the 58 Lloyds puts most of the catering on the 4th, 7th and 8th floors, God knows why, because obviously the food is not important, the, though people still meet there. So what we're saying here is, why don't you bring down the ground? There it can be a meeting place for people. The ground, once more, can be returned to the sort of public activities, eating, there's a museum, there are, there are small shops. Um, there are a whole series of public related activities which we bring out at ground level to try and strengthen the Leadenhall market. And that's the sort of activity that goes on in Lloyd's, that's in the 58 building on the right, which is really an activity which is terribly difficult to measure in its growth potential and also the effects of the microcommunications, the British economy and so on. And so growth and change is the primary problem, and it is the primary reason that Lloyd's is now into its, now into its fourth building. Again, one must point out the amazing wastage. I know lots of people who have this discussion often consider growth and change not important, but every time that Lloyd's has a new building that is a vast expense of demolishing one building, a vast period in which nothing can be done with that site, and another vastly expensive period of rebuilding that a building. So any form of extension of the life of the building is in energy terms, in financial terms, um, a considerable advantage. <coughs> The first sketch for, for, for Lloyd's um, showed, and <coughs> the question that Lloyd's asked us was, design us a building which would last at least 75 years, which is sort of, that having made it wrong four times, we actually was intriguing the idea that it would be quite easy to decide exactly whether we're going to be 75 years time. Um, and of course the major problem was that within months of discussing it, all the predictions of where they're going to be five years, hence let alone 75 years, was were already being changed because suddenly there's the microchip, the opening of the New York Insurance Exchange and so on, all started to have certain effects on the Lloyd structure. So what we looked for was a flexible building and basically it was a series of floors which could be used as, around an atrium, that's that central space, which could be used as offices, as selling space, that's the market space, as a university, as whatever you like, because after all floors are floors are floors. Um, and in which, in certain areas, made principally dictated by sort of uh, fire escape routes, at certain distances there would be service towers or elt points, usually inside the building in corners. They should be much bigger, those corners, it usually takes some 20-20% or so of the space. You have in these corners the toilets, the stairs, the lifts, the cloak rooms and so on. And again, Lloyd's is a major problem, is that you have something like one person for every 10 feet in Lloyd's, uh, which puts fantastic pressure upon all these servant activities. They become vast, they slowly take over the whole Lloyd's situation. And, by and the idea was to create a series of these atriums, which could, any number of these floors could be for the market activity on the right, and to try and deal with these servant activities, uh, these towers, and Lloyd's has always had a number of entrances because of its difficulties of, in of its ins entering and exiting, um, and make some form of a flexible statement out of these. So. Again, a, a diagram in the sense of the relationship between served and servant act spaces, i.e. the spaces which are basic floors, ground, and the elements which serve those. On the left is a diagram which shows that the urban infrastructure, i.e. roads, specifically roads, have hundreds of years of life, thousands of years of life, Roman roads. The buildings, well in London they have approximately 75 years, but anything between a uh, thousand years and uh, 20 years, I suppose, is the life of a building, but it's still considerable. The thing that really has no, uh, or a very short period of life, which doesn't have any um, consistency in, in it, are things like our mechanical systems and appliances and obviously the maintenance of those appliances. And again, the energy crisis has created a situation where whatever we've put, whether it's lifts or whether it's energy systems, they will probably be ripped out within a very short period because economically there's changes taking p place uh, so fast that in purely financial terms it is logical to rip those parts out. 
now you can take, it seems to me that we have two choices. We can either sort of pull our hair and forget about it, or we can say, great, that gives us an opportunity. That is a possibility to use these elements within the architectural form. And so, as I say, on the, le on the right is a sort of early diagram for Lloyds, which showed basically sort of the any the here we're using mass and the energy system of the floors and so on to balance out the hot and cold periods of a building like Lloyds. But the key thing being the on the right hand side being the part which really has this five to fifteen year, five to twenty year life, the mechanical services element. <coughs> and these are diagrams, again developing and taking it a bit further. On the right is the typical floor plan that about uh, 12 floors, or there's si only six are exactly like this, showing a standard sort of 15 meter ring of floor with an atrium in the center glazed at the top and the servant towers with the special activities removed, if you remember that diagram from the corners where they usually block the flexibility of adapting a building, put on the outside where they can be ripped apart when necessary, changed, and where the more temporary pieces can be sort of slipped in prefabricated and so on, and the more sal solid element in the center and the sort of juxtaposition between the, these more temporary towers and the four square building behind it. And these are sort of diagrams of those towers, different colors being sort of fire stairs, firemen's lifts, toilets, meeting rooms and so on, which go around this building and which create this, both the functional, should we say, flexibility, but also the visual, visual, uh, tension between the building <coughs> and the and the towers and the layering between <coughs> the central atrium, the four square building which wraps around it, and the strongly articulated towers in front. And again this whole question upon how to hold the line of a street and how can you if you, one presumes that within the city that one is, should not have large open piazzas, but people should be able to get back from the road, car fumes and so on, and the answer is not possibly a straightforward plaza as there is in front of the CU building, but rather, as it is in a lot of the city, a tight-knit series of spaces defined by the buildings standing on, the, both on, on each side of them, and that these buildings are worth more than a single view. And again, I'd like to say that I think one of the problems about the we say the modern uh, tower is that it is tends to be only worth a quick glance. The passerby does not find sufficient interest to have his eye lead from point to point, as it does, for instance, on G Street's law courts. And also that buildings are not approached on their face. They're really approached usually diagonally. In most situations, this is obviously a classic, they approach diagonally and by creating a series of layering, and G Street does this with these amazing vertical state, these vertical towers which hold the road, I believe, much more in, in a much more interesting way than the flat facade. They hold the, the side of the road and behind that you can get away from the fumes into these sort of small courtyards through the, into a series of further spaces which are pedestrian scale as against the road scale. This photograph must have been taken in the middle of the night, there's no cars. Anyhow. Um, so at ground level we've talked a little bit about the pedestrian, the eye being led to a series of, more, of, more, of interesting activities which slowly open up as you approach them. And then the other point that I want to make is the skyline. The fact that the individual towers in London have become somewhat, though sometimes well well built as the CU, CU or well, well detailed and sometimes poorly, but in the sense that they are, they tend to be flat and somewhat uninteresting and their scale of them therefore to the human being I feel is one of un, un, they are unfriendly they are cold they are wars they don't relate whilst obviously the older buildings around do tend to relate in scale detail grain or many of them and this linking of the 19th and 18th century in, the pre in, histo in history with the 20th century again interests me. And so the element here, in the sense of the skyline element as well, is one of a series of layering of elements of the six towers which mark the building. The major tower being the, sort of the tallest tower being on the line with the Bank, Bank of England being the major, this is the major entrance to, the, to, to Lloyd's, the principal entrance to Lloyd's. And the articulation which 
hopefully will link to the more complex buildings around, as they obviously, you know, in Siena again, with this fantastic sl skyline, this great piazza, but also that from a distance you know what the buildings are. And it seems to me again, you know, standing on Primrose Hill and so on, that the recognition, the view of St. Paul's, let's say, it is not only because it's St. Paul's, but because of the, it's because of this fantastic shape of St. Paul's, which is difficult to say about most modern towers. And the whole question of prefabrication and all right, so these are towers, but then, and these towers are going to be changed. There will be less or more toilets or less or more meeting rooms and so on. And we have a whole now 100 years of technology, 200 years of technology, which allows us to play with these elements so as to bring, to create, as I said, light, shadow, articulation, and not just you know, glass enclosures if, or, or steel enclosures or stone or brick enclosures, but actually a play between a, a, a creating a sort of dichotomy between, in fact, the external elements and the simpler building behind. And the use of that prefabrication and that knowledge and so on. On the right is the facade, the highest facade, which is on Leadenhall Street, which is on line with a, with, a, with, a, with a bank. And here you can again see the contrast between the vertical taut rising sort of towers <coughs> and the flatter facade behind. But again, all the components are legible. You can read the column, you can read the diagonals, you can read the lifts. The lifts are on the outside of the building. They give you great views across London as you go up. On, there's, there's four major clusters of lifts. Um, they give you these views across. Movement is a great excitement to us. We feel that movement is one of the things which there's no excuse for putting long corridors and dreary lifts where you rub shoulders with people you don't really want to in a dark hole. Um, but why not look across London? Why not have that you know, excitement. Um, and on the left is the, a model of Lois, basically a, um, as it is at the stage, with what is the slightly more important entrance on the left, but also ramps ramping into the into it, and the slightly lower area all the way around it, which is the pedestrian area, the the arcaded area, the sh area with the shops, the the restaurants, the public areas, and the more private areas as you go oh. into the building itself. And the whole question of services and what's what is the importance. After all, services fulfill something like 30% of the budget, 25 to 30% of the budget and the area of a building is fast. I mean, they are really fast. So to just hide them, services and structure, seems to us to be, well, to, we prefer <coughs> to use them as part of the way in which you can read the building. And it is, again, this legibility, this relationship between seeing how a building is put together, seeing how it is erected, seeing how it is demolished, and the fact that you can read it, that you can read cities, so that you can read and you can read buildings, if you wish to read them. The quick comparison between Boburg, which was an open-ended structure with a piazza on the, in front of it, the escalators, but again, the Molly sort of the zoning has some links. But I, one side it's people. Um, on the other, <coughs> on the side, this side you can't see the piazza because the piazza is in front of it, just to the left. And on the right-hand side, the mechanical services, and they feed into this, into the building. And instead, Lloyd, which, because of its site, because of its nature, is a, is a building which is enclosed. In other words, it cannot grow horizontally. It can only grow upwards. And the building descends in height towards the lower buildings, the 19th and 18th century buildings, and then goes upwards towards the CU buildings and tall tiles, um, which are much higher than Lloyd's itself. Um, the Chereau House, the translucence, the whole, we've done a lot of work uh, upon this whole theory of, tr of translucence and have made, for instance, in Lloyd's itself, the outer walls of Lloyd's is made, are made out of three series of tr translucent glass with transparent pieces put inside it. But between the glass itself, the glass themselves acts as ducts. In other words, the return air passes through the walls, the glass walls of the Lloyd's building. And, but the key, I mean, of course, here as well as energy is the whole question of how can you make a, a building uh, alive at night, for instance? How can it glow at the day? How can you avoid having to pull black curtains over black areas? How can you make it a wall of light? Glass isn't just a material which is basically black at night or, uh, or, or transparent. It's a material which has tremendous properties which you can recognize and which you can use between solid black marble or translucence or transparency. <coughs> The extension of the architect's role from uh, the normal ex extension, which is the coloured zone here, which is the normal range, which is basically building and touching on environment, touching on components, extending it so it becomes 
a an armament, a weapon in which we can, which we can use and extend our design knowledge, our creativity over by actually understanding as much as possible of the scientific or micro end, as well as much as possible of the macro environmental end, and so that we can use these to give form to our buildings, which are not purely formal formalistic statements. And that was the sort of experiments in, in, in glass. And obviously the whole role of the architect as an explorer, as a creator. Um, on the right, the solar energy, the possibility of accepting these new constraints, which I think really what architecture is about is you take a constraint and you make it into advantage. People always often say, you know, well, I mean, you obviously had all the good clients, but really the game is to get a, a, a dialogue going with a client so that the constraints he sets, first of all, can be clarified, but also can be actually turned out back to become an advantage. The left is a Dutch student who came to us and showed us this work. He was about 19 and he was thinking of taking architecture, doing architecture, and he said, well, of course, in Holland, like everywhere else, um, you can't drive a motorcycle, but I've invented my system, which is really a little bag on the back, and when the police stops me, I close the bag, and then, and then when I want, I just open it. I think it's terrific. I mean, you know, that's invention, that's architecture. Um, a few sort of quick snaps of sort of getting going on with invention. Um, you know, tension structure, steel, especially to us who are very interested in steel, steel works so much more functionally in tension than it does generally in compression. Um, this is the roof going up in France for Cummings Diesel buildings, a shed is an absolute very, very low cost. It's a local authority shed uh, for Cummings Diesel. The only sort of game that we could play was really to cut down the quantity of steel and put the same amount of money in actually uh, refining the pieces and also to try to break the box. It's a <coughs> beautiful hill, it's close to a port, it's got a lot of ships, and the last thing we wanted was a great big box, however elegant that box was. So to break the skyline, we created this tensile roof, saving some 10, 15% of steel, the money going into, into the, the detail, should we say. Um, and on the right is the sort of sketch model of, uh, of Inmos in uh, Newport for the microchip industry. Here it's quite different, whereas on the left, as I say, it is absolutely a shed. It, it was actually going to be 90% storage, 10% production for Cummings. Then they, Cummings were great clients. And uh, when Owen Miller came over, he decided to make the whole building production just because he thought, you know, he enjoyed it. Um, whilst on the right, it is all production, it's all heavily serviced, you can't put the services through the floor because of vibration. Therefore, the services are stacked in the centre where the street, a semi-private street, but that's basically the street in the centre, that is private. And to the left and right are the laboratories, the white, the white, the white spaces, the clean spaces. And once you stack in the most logical place, the mechanical services, you may as well use that as part of the structural system. Back to Cummings, which we finished about two months ago, uh, Cummings Diesel Fleet Guard. Fleet guard. Um, as I said, it's basically a, a local authority, minimum cost, very rather tall storage shed. And this in case it is in, in Moss, um, on the right, the structure going up, but the diagram on the left shows the intention in the sense of the way that the mechanical services feed through the structure, through the roofs, into the clean spaces. It's sort of England's first microchip chip fabrication building. Sorry. Right. Briefly on Boberg, I shan't talk much about this because I think it's sort of you may know it. Uh, the key elements here again on Boberg was why a museum, just a museum, or why just a library? Surely there should be an overlapping of activities, it should be a mixed system, it should be a place which is not just for the elite but for all. The use of the ground for general public activities and the use of the facade of the building to, to strengthen those public oriented activities. And then behind the facade, a series of museums, libraries, children, and so on. And when we first did, when we first won the competition, the first thing we did was to divide the team into sort of two parts. One was what we term, termed the non-programmed activities, another the, pro, the program, which in other words, meeting the program. And non-programmed activities, the main job was to convince the client that he needed more activities than the three that were written in the brief. 
and the idea of these big open floors, with some two football pitches, without any vertical interruptions, and then on one side a series of external corridors for views across London, uh, sorry, Paris, at the top and at the back the, the sort of service zone, the mechanical services zone, and the idea of communicating with the rest of the world on the roof, the sort of the, the, the <laughs> symbol for communication to try and break down the problems of a centralised art cultural uh, center with all its negative as well as positive points. On the left is the diagram of the building as it is with it, all its varied activities. And it is, in my opinion, that the success at the public level, the extension from what we were asked to do, which was a, sort of a building for 5,000 people a day to a building for 50,000 people a day, is principally related to the overlapping of these activities, the introduction of this mass of activities where grandma, infant, grandpa, parent, um, poor, rich and so on, can all actually try find something to do on a rainy day or whatever day <coughs> it is. The piazza in front and the continuity of this piazza, which is shaped as, slightly as an amphitheater towards the building, the continuity in, in some streets in the air, uh, in those external corridors, in the escalator itself, the escalator which in a sense is again the excitement of movement, movement which you find in the Casa del Spagna, uh, in, in, in the steps uh, in Rome, um, and you know, the movement you find in small alleyways and in streets and so on, where people rub shoulders, and there's nothing, and this is really again I think a key element, there's nothing which brings success so much as people bring people. The more people you have, the more people come to watch them, it's a great sport. A section showing the, the streets and the airs on the left. Uh, on the west, the amphitheater piazza, um, the, 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 the floors, the mechanical services, as you see, on, and the building itself defining the street, defining the view towards the Notre Dame at the end of the street on the island, defining one of the great streets of Paris. Um, and then on the other side, by defining the street with this hard, noisy, uh, vehicular orientated uh, building, the side of the building, on the other side, everything is pedestrianized. The these were the first pedestrian routes now in Paris, though now Paris has pedestrianized itself in a way which makes me cry when I see London. Um, the pedestrian zone in front of the building, which goes up the facade and also goes into the ground floor. So the, the, the forum, what we call it, what is called termed the public forum, is again a public place, a place where you can have both art or jazz, where you can do a series of, of activities in a large scale, not just a trio, one trio playing in one space in one uh, theatre, but a whole series of them overlapping of, of, with its mime, with its music, with its poetry, whatever it is, with its politics. It's a meeting place for different times of the day. I should go quickly through these. Um, well, just to make a point, a point on the left that you know we weren't the first people to feel that services could go on the outside, and on the right, on the right, this sort of uh, Meccano systems, the systems which we're interested in. In other words, in the sense, the fact that you can read—that's the column, the waterfill column, the gerberet, which is the bracket, um, the tension, the compression. These members are. Uh, express to give grain scale and, as I said, legibility, but to give shadow, to give what I, you know, uh, interest to the building. <coughs> the feeling that you can tighten it, that you can read it, that the shapes around the column, that collar is defined by the way that the columns drop over the, over, sorry, that the gerberets, the, the brackets drop over the column and drop into place, defines the shape of that vertebrae and gives it this light so that when you start to look up the column you see light shining down the column. I'll just move on with one of the Gerberets in the interior. I mean, the library is typical of sort of, of this question of change. I mean, people say, well, why did you build a museum like that? And I say, well, actually, we never knew whether it was going to be a museum or not. I mean, the museum was a battle from day one. The building was a battle from day one. You can't control these situations. I mean, immediately the curator, the staff, and specifically the, specifically the donors in the Museum of Modern Art, who had, which had only been opened in 1946, saw the proposed scheme for Bobo, they said, Christ, what the hell do we want to move into this ghastly building? So immediately the museum said, we're not going to move in. And then ensued three years of political fight between Pompidou, the museum curators, the donateurs, the don and so on, and then Pompidou being a very good vertical system as it is in for, bad vertical system if you like, in France, Pompidou, one day the 
curator found he didn't have the same job and they, he brought in a Swede. And the Swede said, okay, we're going in, into the museum. So now we suddenly again had the museum. And then we heard, well, you can, yes, the, the, the museum will be opened, or the museum people will come in, um, if you, architects, design team, engineers, can persuade the donors and the control of most of the artworks in the Paris building, the key works are controlled by these donors to come in. Of course, we couldn't persuade any, any of the donors to come into the museum. The only way we could persuade them then was to have a, a talk with the donor of one of the major uh, art, uh, art collections and ask him what he wanted. And he said, I want a little building all to myself in the piazza. So we gave him the little building all to myself in the piazza. And then when and the rest of the, of the people all suddenly saw that the key person had moved and they all came into the museum. But you don't really know for how long anything is going to be occupied or when it will, or what will happen to it in the present or future. The library too, which was going to be a million books, is now half a million books and the rest is audiovisual. The library started for the first year, we were told, was going to have 2,000 people per day, has 13,000 people a day. It is packed. It's a, length, not a, it's a uh, research library and it's basically a university type library and it is absolutely packed, mainly because there's such a mixed series of use, slides, or film, books, and so on. It's the activity. Um, on the right is this, game, this question of framework. One of our principal interests is in trying to find a balance between change and permanence. In other words, in any form of urban uh, context, if you're going to give change, you've also got to be able to keep this a, some form of order. You can't just say anything can happen because obviously there is a scale, there is a grain. So you're looking for a, a balance between the sort of change and, and order. And what, to me, one of the key elements is can we can, we've developed over the last, again, many years, our ability to change on plan. Flexible plans are quite normal. But they're certainly not boring to me. Um, sections, also possible, but elevations are very tight. You can't, you know, the pink window will burst, I'll talk to you, will see it in a moment, will burst the facade. Can you create a situation where services, movement, and all that will change, where you don't know what's going to happen tomorrow? It's impossible in large buildings to dictate. Even the fire laws, even the, the fire committee changes its mind every other day, so you, know, you never know if it's going to be solid or, or transparent or, or whatever it is. In that sort of situation, either you're going to use unbelievable muscle, muscle which I have my doubts about, either, <coughs> from, either to the client or even to the, to the many controlling security agencies, or you're going to have to create, to create frameworks which, allow, which can crumble at the edges and still look as though they have a control, the intended control of the environment. So what we're looking for is a layered system, an a structure, a system of layers where it doesn't really matter terribly where the escalators are. Another one is added, as it probably will do, because the library is a great success, so we're going to need another escalator to it. Or where on, the, on Bobo we lost the whole of the east facade from transparent to solid, for political reasons basically, all over one weekend. At this point we could either have basically retired or spend another year fighting them, or accept the, you know, a, that's a lost battle, but the fight goes on at other, at other, in other areas. A lost fight, and this sort of here's the framework again. That was the competition drawing of the principal elevation, either public elevation on the, on the piazza, the escalators and the lifts and so on. But also the idea that the elevation is actually again in theatre. The people, the audiovisual, they are the key elements of the building. They are as important. They are more important than anything else you put there. And it's people watching people, pe people watching films, people watching change. The pink door becomes a blue door. The film becomes a different film, etc. A problem of control under mm -hmm. Norman and Team Four. I mean, this I think sort of stopped me for permanently from trying to do, I suppose, pure facades. I, at the success level of, of Reliance Controls was the fact that it was a terrific uh, exercise in putting very simple components together into, a, I think, a, a well-defined, highly legible. I mean, there's obviously a very definite link between Reliance and Boberg, i.e. the sort of legibility of the components, the way they're put together. So here they're just off the peg components in Boberg, the building is big enough to use a number of special components, of prefabricated components, but for me Reliance is still one of the most successful. As I said, the heartache is when you start, when you know, the next user, the next client, because you know, from day to day that guy is moving, 
he no longer understands the use of it, and bang, in goes the window or a series of windows. Help. And there are worse slides than that, I just don't have the heart to put them on, of reliance. And this, the search for this sort of much denser uh, fabric, which can take this sort of thing happening, and again, the excitement of movement, the escalators, people watching people, um, more martial in the distance, people what, going out, watching out there, down below, the fire eaters, the mine, the groups, the clusters, and so on. And obviously, again, the viewing platform. And if you think, after all, the corridor, again, having spent spending now much of my time in the GLC, the corridor is a drear. But does it really have to be a drear? And the piazza, the, the piazza, the circus, the flowers, the, the children, the, the people who come to, to, to entertain themselves here, and the lost battle, which was in fact the audiovisual in Boberg, the audiovisual was lost because somebody suddenly realized that maybe the piazza would be successful, maybe this ghastly building before it was opened, and I say ghastly because the press, they were very attracted, of course. Um, suddenly, somebody thought, but well, maybe there will be a lot of people, and they said, well, if there's going to be a lot of people, who's going to actually control the communication systems, the left, the right, the anarchists, or whatever it may be? And so we lost the electronic systems on the facade, even though the money had already been allocated. Finally, as far as schemes, Coin Street um, and, the and the possibility of, for us, weaving together a piece of somewhat forlorn London which punches into the centre of London due to that fantastic bend in the river, the possibility of the Waterloo Station with a quarter of a million trips a day, the fact that within a mile, within a thousand yards of Coin Street, we have St. Paul's, you have uh, the Houses of Parliament, you have Trafalgar Square. In other words, it actually is practically in the heart of London, but it's also divided, it's completely split off from London by this vast, fabulous barrier of the Thames, which is totally underused and which is poorly linked. When linked, it's always, it is nearly always linked way back from the actual edge of the Thames, unlike, let's say, the Seine. The Seine is only a third, about a third narrower than the, than the Thames, but it feels about a quarter, because basically the bridges on the, ten, on the Seine go from bank to bank. Waterloo Bridge starts sort of a third of a mile back on each side and manages to sort of triple the distance, or the feeling of distance, or the feeling of barrier between the two. And also this whole question of segregation of ghettos, of the cultural ghetto for the elite, of the office let, let ghetto for the developer and for the youth and for the office workers the housing dilapidated de uh, area because it is slowly dying and a, a, a little death of its own because they're very the shops are very poor because the people living in that area have the people don't have this sort of att attractions to people with, with uh, who uh, would create a mixed community poor and rich blue and white collar this whole sort of running down of an area. <clears throat> Yet vast investments, the Festival of Britain, the potential has been recognized for years and years, that, that this is the area where one should bridge, that this is the area which could connect with London, which, which could be different, but it could also be linked. And basically the National Theatre, um, which is a public institution, which does at least start to, uh, in a limited way, use the river, the Festival Hall, the um, cultural centre and then suddenly shell with this amazing backdrop, backdrop to this public statement, totally freezing the ground, totally making a barrier to what is going on in front of it. Again for me the, the question about the first shell, and when I say shell it could also be other buildings, London Weekend Television is another one and, I, and no doubt IBM will be at another. The problem with these buildings is not that there shouldn't be offices, it's the way that these offices are organised. Um, there's nothing wrong with being an office worker is the fact that Shell totally gives nothing to the public. It, gives, it was going to give cultural centres, it was going to actually give squash courts, it was going to give sports centres and so on, and on the day of opening, it suddenly said, I'm sorry, we've got security problems. And no wonder everybody, there's a, a war going on in this area. And the sort of activities which you can find along the, the, the route, linking Waterloo Station, linking the South Bank uh, Centre, along with the principal the series, a hierarchy of routes, of open pedestrian uh, routes. Most of this area is in our, within our project has been pedestrianised, related to whether to uh, this, well, the key route being the Glaze Street, and along that street, 
shopping, um, leisure activities, water and related activities, an sunk in the amphitheatre to get away from the wind. I mean, it's no good just having green areas, as you see outside the GLC. If, the, if you know the north wind is the principal wind, you actually have to sink an area to get an open, an open area. Ac leisure activities have also got to be <coughs> looked after, have got to have their own house. And I won't go through all the form of activities, but these are the sort of activities varying between city orientated and station orientated, water and land and so on. And a model, the model showing the series of buildings, the along a chain of buildings, if you like, of beads along this, the, the, the principal route, housing the curved housing to the to the south facing south and linking in with the Coin Street housing, and basically amphitheatre and water related activities and the sort of small island and a pedestrian bridge linking up with the temple and the north bank. The right hand drawing, which is probably a key drawing, the yellow is housing, um, blue is public related activities, offices, office, uh, sorry, non-office activities. The offices are all above and just the little red dots show the where, where the offices actually touch the ground. That's basically your escalator, your entrance, your lifts, and all the rest is basically public. So the ground is sort of given back, if you like, to, walk, to public activities. The river walks, the purple is a sunken piazza, and so the yellow is, basically, is housing. And a view down the, um, down the uh, glazed street through one of the gateways. And there's a series of gateways between the bees, four gateways, one at each end and two in the center, which allow north-south movement, which encourage north-south movement to the river so as not to create a barrier. You can either move between each bead or through those, gate, those, low, those low gateways. This being a gateway, this perspective is taken through one of the gateways towards the buildings with offices above. And obviously images which you, you know <coughs> in Milan, again, the, sort of, you know, the ground for the people, the offices above, the sketch of the street, in Coin Street, quick diagram showing the idea of the hinges, how the hinges, the mechanical service systems, the things I've talked about in Lloyd's, separated from the general office space, the uh, Glaze Street section, the lowest section showing the section through well, the distances of London Weekend Television, and the sort of sunk, sunken amphitheatre. And the fact that here again, what, on the right is the offices, the sort of flexible offices which can be other activities, workshops or um, you know, say university or whatever it may be. And so it won't be offices in 25 years. Maybe it won't be, in which case it'll be housing. Well, one's paying you know, considerable, well, amazing sums for um, housing over the river at the moment, um, which in fact is converted from warehouses which uh, don't take easily to mechanical services but are great spaces. And so we're saying, if you do this, surely you can quite easily, much more easily, adapt it to housing. So the left hand shows how it could be adapted to housing, how the spaces could be adapted to housing. And a, a sort of a elevation of one corner of one of the service t towers, um, lifts, uh, toilets and so on, and the escalators going up from the ground, so that's the office entrance on the right, office entrance going up to the office lobby, and from that into the offices, that's sort of grain on the left. Um, a detailed model of one of the hinges where the mechanical services work with them, where they use, and the actual scale of the buildings themselves um, going up from sort of 16 floors, going down to sort of seven floors in the center, and then up again. The gateway, the gateway buildings being the tall, two tallest buildings at each end. At, sorry, I'm saying that again. Uh, again, this <coughs> on the right, well, on the left is a, a further sketch of the sort of, of the public area ground, the offices above, and research into how can you create sort of standard component systems where the elevations can change, where it doesn't really matter if it's sort of small, large panes, and so on. Um, and the street again, the street area is given over to the people. But again, this intrigue, this thing which interests us of how can you create a sort of system which allows you to put a balcony if you want a balcony, a red blind if you want a red blind, so on. Where is that on the right? Where it's in, it's in Spain, and, yes. Coronia. Coronia, yes. Um, the l tallest building, the gateway building, in the sense of cross leaping across the Thames, the bridge, and again, it's not it's pie in the sky as far as the bridge is concerned. I mean, the developer, from the mo first moment we talked to him about it, or very early on, 
back to Solnit on the basis that the difference in rent between south and north is between 12, per, 12 pounds and 20 pounds per square foot. If you put a bridge, it's likely that he can charge 14 pounds a square foot and therefore he'll be able to supply the bridge and make a profit on it because it's a direct link and people like Shell, who are on the north bank, are more likely to take the space on the south because basically they'll be able to be, feel as though they're, they're all part of the same area. The more enriched north bank will be more easily linked. So the bridge is paid in that, in that way. Here again, Nor Norman's fabulous building in Ipswich, but which is a way of following the site, freely following the site, filling the site, but also states something which I think is important, that is that glass has very different, different appearances at different parts of the day or night. Often it is very black and very solid, defines a solid element. If one wants a different form of transparency, and here we're back into this sort of word transparency, what is transparency? Is it just glass? Then there is a form of transparency which I would suggest is related to a, a layering of elements. That's a more traditional, it's a, it's a Roman Renaissance Greek transparency. And this is not gaps between buildings, uh, between an object which stands in space and its further buildings, but it's a gap within the buildings. It's holes within buildings which are, uh, where the building doesn't let light through, but you feel there is a con visual continuity through that space. And here again, obviously, this is sort of strengthened by you know, uh, Khan is the classics of the servant, servant spaces, the towers reaching for the sky, but the space and the shadow between those towers and the back cloth. Palladio, again, the sort of the framework. Okay, it's static, obviously, no one dares change anything in it, but within that, it seems to us to signal the possibilities, not only that buildings of the ground are public, buildings have a public facade, building art is is a theatre. They, they have a theatrical role in relation to the people who watch them, as well as being functional, of course, but they have this element, but also that in, within a certain framework you could probably start to change the pieces. And also then that technology can be as human as, as anything else that really buildings, architecture is about enjoyment, people's enjoyment, fun. Thank you very much. I think that's very uh, thought-provoking, and uh, Richard covered an enormous amount of ground. So, uh, I mean, anyone can can take their pick. Uh, I, the one thing I thought was terrific um, about uh, a lot of the buildings and sites he covered was the the sort of um, interest in putting back into the city um, things. He said right at the beginning that you can take anything out of the city and it will always be a meeting place. Well, I'm not sure that you actually meant that. No, I mean, I meant the reverse. Sorry, yes, I mean, basically, uh, I don't think you can take anything out of the city. Uh, oh. I think what we've got to do now is to pile more into it. I mean, just imagine what would happen if they decided to build the Lloyd's Building in, in Milton Keynes, God's okay. sake. Um, what, we, you know, how much you would have actually torn out of the city in, in all its ramifications and, and it, the, the, the sort of effect it, it actually has in spreading out around the actual site where it is. If you'd actually taken it out, you know, it'd be more than extracting a tooth, it would have been extracting a, you know, a, a huge kind of activity. And I think that um, he's shown that sort of consciousness of the need to actually um, throw everything back in that you possibly can. Well, who wants to kick off? Well, I'll try it. Um, Richard, it seems to me that um, at Pompidou, there's, there's a very clear declaration about the difference between the, the general and the particular, and, that, and <coughs> the, um, the face, if you like, of uh, uh, Pompidou, which, which is offers, offers allegiance to the square, is quite clearly concerned with the general, and all the mechanical equipment is quite clearly concerned with a particular line in the street. But at Lloyd's, it seems to me that um, there isn't that sort of declaration and that there is this ring of services around the building which doesn't give um, greater emphasis or value to one aspect of the building as opposed to any other. And, if, and, and it seems to me that Leavenhall Street, in a sense, is a more important street than the others. 
which is signaled by the, by the your sort of repositioning of the of the old old uh, portico. But I mean, was this conscious decision, or did you did, did you wish Lloyd's to have that equal value around its perimeter rather than giving emphasis to one address or another? Yes, I think it was conscious. I mean, when Lloyd's approached us and talked to us. Lloyd's is the closest we've ever had to a client with which we have had a very detailed and successful dialogue from the beginning. And when Lloyd's approached us, they made it very clear that, yes, there is one entrance which is slightly more important. In other words, occasionally the mayor or the queen or whatever it is goes up. But basically, all six entrances, and it's true, Lloyd's has had five, six entrance, entrances for quite a long time, have about the same value. Um, Therefore, and also unlike Bobo, and Mo Bobo was a statement of which we, we said, on one side it is, we're going to, we'll call it the people's place, either public activity area. That's where you get all the um, people related. On the other side it's mechanical, it's hard, it's, it's dirty, if you like, in the sense of being cars, fumes and so on. That's the street side. And therefore we position the building right on the edge of the side, if you like, so that it defined very clearly the pedestrian and the car areas. This doesn't happen on Lloyd's. Basically on Lloyd's, it is very much more mixed. The, the streets are very narrow. The traffic is very, doesn't flow freely. It's much more related to, pede to pedestrian activities. Um, all the way around the building itself is a small pedestrian zone. It's not a deep zone. We started from the beginning saying, it's our opinion that in this area there should not be a piazza. You already have CEU piazza, and, that's, and no one uses that really apart from a, a view. Um, by a view of a building on a flat facade. <coughs> and it, it has no activities around the CUPS. It's a very, very formal statement. It just is a, a platform. Um, <coughs> therefore, we don't want to add that. So once you said that, it seemed to be logical to us that the building should f f fill the whole site. And sure, it makes subtle recognitions to its position. I, the lending hall facade is by far the tallest. It's got the, it has a canopy side on it. It's got the, uh, it's of the four sizes, the more muscular. Um, but over, and it has, because of it has the CUPS, so you will see it a little bit more freely than the other side, so it recognises those. But basically, there's very little difference between Lime Street. I mean, the existing law is, is on Lime Street. Um, it has a perfectly good entrance line, a moderately good entrance off Lime Street. Um, it doesn't have a single street, which is very much more important. It descends in height towards the back, because the buildings and Lenhall Market is lower. So it's purely a height situation. And again, on Lloyd's, um, you have a situation where basically the whole building is offices and therefore views have to be taken morally evenly all the way through just because of the whole idea of being offices. You can't blank off one facade and close one facade and open another. A museum or a library, because they're general purpose spaces, it doesn't matter terribly if you, you can say one side has all got services and has very little view out. I mean, it has even less now, it's all solid behind the services, but it always has, but, and the other side is all open where the people are. You don't have that clear, that's form of clear distinction. So there is instead of vertical stacks. The movement is vertical, and it is in a series of towers outside the sort of four-square building. The building itself doesn't grow. Bobo building, the theory was that it's a linear building, and that it could, and it did in a sense advance, because immediately we arrived in Bobo, uh, in Paris, they suddenly said, ah, oh, but there's a new department which we've decided to, uh, you could have, when we were making problems about let's have more departments, isn't it? which is the Boulez Music Research, and they knocked a few more buildings or old buildings down, in fact, any area they knocked, down in the south to open up, and we opened up the piazza towards uh, the church to the south of, of, of Bobo. And that, theoretically, if we hadn't thought the church was a super church and the piazza would be better and the music research center would be better underground, we could have extended the building in a linear dimension. There's no way that lawyers could, that we, that lawyers could be extended that way. It doesn't have that linear growth. So if you don't have linear growth in that direction, that means that the values on all four sides tend to be more or less the, the same. Whilst, as I said, in Boburg, really you could say the two ends are open-ended, the, the narrow ends are open-ended, I think actually the least successful ends in a way, but they are the open-ended uh, elements, and then there are two closed, more closed, the two closed ends, one's public, <laughs> people, one's car. It's a different sort of uh, brief. Could I, could I take Aidy's... Um Comment a bit further. It seems to me that the uh, two um, yeah, faces of, the, of the, your uh, Bobo building re represent two quite different sorts of significance. Mm. Um, and actually, yes. for me, um, do point up what I think is a dilemma in what you're doing. Um, and it's a dilemma in modern architecture. 
um, in a lot of modern architecture generally. It's a dilemma of um, the coincidence of significance of form and content, I think. Um, I think that the, um, the, the face of the building towards the, um, the public space, um, everything that that says is, is about the, the, the public um, presence of the building. Um, I think the structure is about the building in a general sense. And the uh, movement um, circulation is public uh, and general circulation, which is celebrated. The other side of the building, it does seem to me that the, the architecture, and evidently um, enjoyed, um, is, is, in, is without significance um, publicly. That, 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 that there's nothing of importance uh, about that service system in any, any sort of public sense. And I felt that there was a problem in your analogy between the, um, the liveliness of the architectural elements that are external on the Lloyd's building and, on the, and the, um, the Siena or whatever image. Because in the, in the images of cities, hitherto, all the bits that have stuck up um, have been uh, pretty potent symbols, actually, of the, the various powers in society. Um, and obviously a city like London in the 18th century, if one thinks of sort of Canaletto views and so on, is a kind of, uh, it's the hierarchy that's described by the prominence of the bits, the spires, and indeed the dome of St. Paul's to which you refer, are all um, potent visual things that are potent formally, but they're also very potent in their, their um, social significance and, and so on. And it seems to me that the Lloyd's building um, does have a kind of dilemma because all, all the architectural bits that have the kind of whiz-bang about them um, are um, sort of things to do with loos and escape stairs and so on. And they, they don't have public significance. <coughs> Presumably you don't see that as a problem. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's start. That's a hell of a long a series of questions. I mean, first of all, let's analyse what you call the historic importance of the towers. Well, of course, in Victorian times, they usually marked clock towers or toilets at the bottom, but anyhow, here we've reversed it. Um, uh, that's the beginning of the day. Okay, but, clock, okay. <laughs> but uh, okay, well, in historic towers, they usually, mainly in Italy, they used to be places in which you could pour oil down on other people. Mm. Yeah. Could be argued that that is a sort of not the most best reason for building. I mean, it could also be argued to be the best reason or not, but on your argument, it could be probably not the best reason for building tent buildings because that wasn't a social or something other <laughs> significance, or perhaps it was. Now, so I would argue that, in fact, one of the beauties about, let's just say, some of the towns such as Luca, where the towers were, this, was that not only were there these series of towers which marked as you approached the city from a distance, but then somebody did something which I think was an even more greater idea, which is they started to plant vast trees on the towers, and so you suddenly had all these trees on these vast, on these on these vast towers, and a terrifically poetic and important image. But also this, this was a statement, as you say, about certainly about the function of the people, but maybe of the importance of, the per of that person or that individual in combating, basically combating, originally combating his next door neighbour, he would build that tower, the next guy would build a tower a bit higher, and the next one. It's very difficult to say to, to argue this has been. Uh, you know, to give it the meaning which I think you're, tr you, you're giving it, at least I would argue that. As far as the towers, which I, I think they have a tremendous urban context, that's the, the importance today of those towers. They have a tremendous excitement, visual excitements, and they have a, an enrichment of street level as you go along and you see these points in space, which had a function, this function which can be discussed. As far as Lloyd's is concerned, or as far as I think what one is saying, by the the principal, the principal social activity that goes on in towers is all movement, as the escalators. I must say that I didn't point this out very clearly, but each one of those towers has a series of four to eight external glass elevators which will give you a view out of across London and then bridge from that into sort of glazed links, mm. another view across London. So, in a sense, the movement thing is a key element. I actually have nothing, I don't, I mean, I hear again we're back in, this, uh, in a very difficult evaluation, and we've had, I've discussed this obviously before, and that is, is structure fundamentally much more important than age 
VAC duct. I find this value very complicated to balance. I certainly don't try to balance it in, in, the, in the building. Um, there is, but the major difference between the HVAC truck and the structure, as I see, is that the structure is likely to be there for a long time, which is therefore uh, has a specific role, because in other words, if you remove the structure, the building goes. Whilst the electrical conduit or the heating and ventilating duct or the whatever elements you have there, um, or even including the, 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 the toilet pods in that situation or the meeting rooms, are more likely to be changed, and therefore want the but to me, the more important thing is, can one create a juxtaposition where they can be changed and the building still has the urban balance? That's a pretty broad term, anyway, but a sort of, a sort of a, an integrity that even after it's changed, it still stands there. I find it very difficult to evaluate um, what a servant activity is. I mean, I suppose you could argue that, you know, Louis can't go the wrong, the wrong way around. He put his service, I mean, I know he put them in bricks, but they are evaluated as service towers on the outside and really after all it's all about people and the people should be on the outside of the ducks but I think it's a pretty difficult one to argue I mean it's a difficult one to sort of I can't, I can't balance it anyhow um, I just follow up with this kind of the relationship of the, um, the community of the public um, with your coin street development and uh, you know the public inquiry has been going on now for about three months um, I'd like to ask yes. you, uh, three years, if you want to say something. Well, for me, I say, for the only person who passes it, you know, uh, the site, I spent months and months, and you see a vast dereliction of, of empty warehouses and car parks and things like that. One wonders, A, what it is that the uh, protesters are protesting about. And also, I'm saying, I'd like to know what you think. Um, uh, <coughs> um, they're protesting. I'm saying there might be two. There might be two arguments here. But I'm saying, uh, for me, I don't know what it's about. Um, um, after a year of listening to the protests, could you tell me? Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> okay, I think that you can. One can well understand the <coughs> argument in the sense of the antipathy of the people who are opposing the opposers, if you like, in the sense that I do feel that they have been done done numerous times, many too many times, that many promises have been given and very seldom carried out, and that if they look around themselves and say, and, you know, we're about to get, I mean, I put that slide on, you know, we're about to get what is already just only half a mile up the river, after all, um, the Albert Embankment or, you know, even closer, Shell, and said, I'm not discussing that, the architectural pros and cons of the, of the glazing penetration, penetration. At that level, you can well understand that the public at large should feel, we're about to get a developer and we're going to be screwed, yet again. And all the promises that have been given, and the many promises have been given all the way at you know, different developments, have seldom been actually carried out. And the difficulty with that is, of course, that if you take that <coughs> negative prophecy, then it is actually self-determinating. In other words, what you're really saying is every scheme is going to could be bad, and that's true. I mean, um, I mean, I, you know, it's easy to talk about things that I've involved, been involved with. I mean, Boba, you know, you, you can argue um, could have been a. I mean, okay, apart from those who already dislike it, I mean, it really could be a monument to Pompidou, end of, the end of discussion, if you like, as far as it is, I mean, you're being a failure to me, uh, in a sense. And you could well argue that's what it was meant for, and if it was interpreted, and I think that's what the brief was about. I mean, the brief basically was, every, every French president leaves his mark, and it's basically whether it's an arch, uh, whether it's a, a, a motorway along the Seine, whether it's an airport, it's basically not about the uh, people so much as about the president. Having said that, if you, the advantage here is that the president does give you the opportunity. The developer does give you the opportunity. <coughs> if the developer is sympathetic, and in the end it is patronage, then you can manipulate that opportunity to be, I believe, a, a fairer, a more balanced, it's difficult to say totally, because obviously there are, uh, <coughs> it's a complex situation, but you, are like, you can achieve a certain success at the aims which you may think to have to be values which you want to keep. Now, there's obviously a feeling, and I guess it's an understanding of feeling 
in the, by, in the locality that, first of all, there's a shortage of housing. There's a shortage of housing everywhere, by the way, but there's a shortage of housing there as well. And if I live in a locality, I can think of nothing I'd like more than a house in the Thames, if I, and, and, and it's understandable. And in a sense of the lo level of the public participation, and I mean the serious public is against the sort of flag waving or any other, and there's a hell of a lot of, of that. This is very understandable. What is less understandable is the, in my opinion, is the uh, professional prostitution. In other words, the tendency for a vast number of people who should know a bloody lot better to be anti, not to question, not to see the, the, the positive points, as well as questioning the, 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 the negative. In other words, the discussion we're having now about, let us say, you know, uh, um, the, the form of a building in the sense of being you know, the, the value you may give to service structure seems to me to be perfectly positive in the situation, the value of the public role and so on. But what it does happen, I think, and here I, you know, I'm very sort of uh, you know, negative about it, I say profession, I don't even mean our own profession, is that I think that there is a tremendous poverty of, of uh, integrity of trying to explain that, that there are possibilities, and then having explained the possibilities, the real role, it seems to me, that not so much the public, but those who lead the public, those who should know better should do, is to see that the aims are defended. I mean, we're all scared. I mean, you know, I know, you know Gordon Graham's been with us for, through the whole thing. We're all worried about what may happen tomorrow. I mean, I don't know. I mean, the market may collapse in the sense that, you know, officers may go for a song, or, or there may be yet another political you know, revolution or whatever else, and you know, and, and Lloyd's may go broken, or goodness knows, and there's a possibility that, you know, I mean, Lloyd's is going through a very, to take another quite complex period. England's going through, and Lloyd's is part of Britain, the economic situation. And maybe Lloyd's will go, God help us all, I mean, no press, may go broke. Therefore, if you're going to Britain, let's build a building. But on, on your thing about uh, promises being made and then disappearing, I mean, you know, you quoted Shell and mm. squash club and all that, but I'm trying to remember even Lasden's IBM building, which I mean isn't finished yet, I mean, that had some public goodies in it, didn't it? Which have already been yes, the taken out. Yeah. I mean, that's actually happening now. I mean, that's what the, they don't believe you anymore. And that's what worries me. And, and they've got some rights to it. I mean, I, I, there's no question that. I can't remember what what the goodies were in IBM for the life of me. I don't know about Shell better. There was going to be a pub in the previous no, scheme which was something, yeah. but they didn't they didn't have my scheme at all. No, in, <laughs> in, in Dennis's scheme, there, there was something <laughs> promised <laughs> as a public goodie. The half the problem with that it, 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 it's again. is this question of controlling the developer, isn't it? I mean, uh, did they have that problem with Regent Street? I mean, it wasn't the same kind of uh, split between um, a, a hired designer and a kind of financial force, hmm. was there? I think that uh, I mean, do you, Regent do Street you did have a lot of intriguing problems. I mean, it did have a, I mean, uh, and the Parliament did set up a inquiry, okay, it was, a par it was a parliamentary inquiry in which the chaired by a surveyor, it was three of them, and I don't know whether they listened, how much they listened to the public, and so on and so on. But I mean, it did go through a hell of a, a lot of ups and downs. And they knocked down part of the stuff to do it, too. Yes, I'm not, yeah. okay, yes, the only thing I'd say is that at this point, I'm not, and I don't, I'm not an expert there, I've read sort of, I've read a certain amount of Nash, um, but I mean, in the end, what one must say is that it would be difficult to see how one I mean, Regent Street is a ma one of the major attributes, like you know, the parks, let's say, mm -hmm. it seems to me. And when I say Regent Street, I extend it up to the buildings around Regent's Park and down to sort of uh, St. James's Park. It is one of the things which seem to me are of tremendous richness. Now, having said that, I'm not saying that's the only way of planning. I mean, you can always uh, say that the city, with its more ad hoc situation, but within the city, there are many great buildings. And within you know, Florence, there are many great buildings. And, it, and we must, at one level, be careful not to end up by saying, Christ, nothing may happen. We must do nothing. Because, <coughs> I mean, that is to me, the worst of, of all solutions. And I don't think we can say, well, this is, this is 
You can't work. <laughs> you can't do nothing. You Anything that happens, nothing. somebody's behind yeah, it. You I mean, somebody nothing. designs it. You can't, you can't do nothing, and in the end, the, those people who say, well, this is a terrible period, and therefore we should wait for the better period, but I mean, what is, I mean maybe the next period will be worse. I don't know what a terrible Everything's period is. a conscious decision. You can do nothing for a long time. I mean, they've done nothing on Kind Street. <laughs> <laughs> you can delay, I guess. You can maneuver, delay. De and, but that is actually doing a very positive. I mean, doing nothing. You're leaving a car park there, and, presume, and that is positive. I mean, take a normal spot if you like. In other words, you make it positive decision that you haven't got the confidence to do anything, not even to grow Cedric Price's trees. Um, you know, he's suggested the answer to most, you know, is that perhaps we should just grow trees everywhere until we make up our mind which way we're going to go. Personally, um, I sympathize with that view, but I, but I don't know whether the next decade is going to be any better. I mean, we can only, in the end, we have to evaluate. We have to say, okay, this is worth something, this is worth little, and this is Daniel. What do you think, in fact, on Coin Street, the, the, the opposers' fear is, what the rip-off they fear is? Because to pretend that you're being ripped off when you lose a squash <coughs> quarter of pub, it's, it's pathetic in urban, in urban terms. I mean, but what, do, what do you suspect they, they fear that will, will change? So we're not, I mean, you know, these are symbols yeah. of the pub and the yeah, right, right. But I, mean, I think that, you know, it's more than that because they feel <coughs> that, you know, they want something they can use. And I say, I mean, that's, that's the tension. Surely they think that, that they, they feel an overpowered community in the same way that yes, Covent Garden yes. feels so overpowered by all sorts of new people coming in and taking their, but, their goodies away. But that's part of it. But I think it's more, it's worse. I mean, it's really, after all, they say, but at least right at the moment, even with a car park there, at least we can get down to the Thames and sort of with our, with our uh, um, what they call it, you know, those things that sort of pick up metal, metal detectors and so on. At least we can have some fun. I mean, by the time you guys are finished with it and put car back up there. It's surely terribly simple. I mean, you look at any building that a developer's done individually or collectively. You look what was there before and which you know, which way would you go? It's no, worse. So if you're the consumer, <laughs> no, no. Yes, what's your absolutely. conclusion? It was the same on Hammersmith. I mean, basically, if I hadn't have been presenting a scheme to public meeting, I'd be opposing it if I, you know, if I wasn't um, so you have to in on the act. I mean, because, you know, look what uh, developers and others have done to Hammersmith. Um, so, I mean, it's hardly surprising, is it? I mean, no, you know, no. the fact that there is somebody who tries to reverse that tide, um, you know, it's hardly surprising that he's having a difficult time, I'm talking now of the developer, uh, yeah. convincing everybody that he's different from everybody who's walked that way in this country before. Yeah. 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 I think if I can just take that Something point up. with a long spoon, But there are differences, and, you know, I mean, the sad thing about, you know, if I can take up the spot by Hammersmith, is that the spot I can see exactly, we're going to have exactly what, in the end, what happened is it was a wonderful att attack, well-organized uh, attack, um, for a wide variety of, of, uh, of reasons, one because but the major reason is one didn't recognise the quality that one was built into that scheme. What does one get in the end there? Because of the stack of confidence, is going to be exactly that which they didn't want. I mean, they're going to get just that which they were worried they were going to get. And this, the point one's making is that in the end, and I do hear you know feel there is a very strong professional. Uh, uh, argument for getting together a certain amount. That is, that if we don't start to recognise differences, and if we don't actually back them up to the hill, we, I believe, are lost in this game. Because in the end, as I think Norm rightly put, but the best thing we can do is to keep the, like, what was there before. I mean, you know, it's, I mean, it's, it's it is the developer they don't trust. I mean, well, I think you would agree yes. that in your talks with them, yes, um, you know, yes. they're prepared to believe you. Mm. They feel sorry for you. I mean, the story of Hammersmith as, 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 as the twisty yeah. marriage were, you know, were public petitions to try and reinstate yeah. the scheme, but it was then yeah. too late. Too late. Um, and we're having the same thing again, you know, right around the corner from there. I, I feel with a scheme by whatever what they call the. Um, well, <laughs> yes, that's right. But all sorts of scheme again. You see, right back to square one. I mean, I think that the sort of Riverside scheme has got into a certain integrity. I'm not an expert on it, and I haven't studied in great detail. But it sure is better than most of the things that we're going to get in that area. And I mean it in the, in the best sense of the word. I believe it has integrity. And here we go again. But uh, I think it's rather naive to expect um, people no. who are, let's face it, motivated by maximizing profit, and that's what it's all about, to do charitable acts. I mean, I, I, it, it's never happened. It, it, 
I mean, St. Catherine Dock, uh, the dock, uh, this development that, you know, originally had far more kind of social content. And I remember 10 years ago when I met this man from Taylor Woodrow, Drew, Peter Drew, he, he told me what he was going to do, you know, and how it was all working class housing um, uh, next to luxury flats. And I said, you know, I just don't believe it. I mean, where, where, where's the working class housing? It's gone. All the things, uh, all the things which weren't profitable drop out, and it always happens, and it always will happen, and I don't blame people when they're skeptical about this thing, because uh, developers are motivated by one thing only, are they not? But, but, but then you mustn't, then really, should, if I may say so, I think you have to give up architecture, because it's not developers, it's capitalism you're talking about. Yeah. Well, so then at which point, what you really have to decide is, I'm either not a capitalist at all, I don't... Because and because I believe this, which I believe is wrong, by the way, because the greatest mm -hmm. I can think of, you say, well, it does you exactly have a need for all the symbols you've given up in Italy. Well, capitalism at its most yeah, right. Absolutely, I'm not. No, that's the point I'm about to make. Okay. You're muddling two words. Absolutely. Really. Um, you're talking about developers um, <laughs> being charitable. Why should they be charitable, for God's sake? But there is a difference between whether they're enlightened or not. Mm -hmm. And if you take a long, longer term view, and you take a, you know. A an enlightened view, then basically you don't burn your boats um, in the way that developers in this country have done. And I mean, now I can remember sort of, I mean, as long ago as 10 years back, I mean, Fred Olson saying the developers in your country are absolutely crazy. They're bad businessmen because it's going to bite them back. You know, they're taking a short term view. And I mean, you know, the, the, the kind of values that we've been talking about do get incorporated into buildings in other countries, which have been done by enlightened developers who are certainly not poor, and I suspect make a better profit than the British developers, and I think will have their credibility, and will have a long-term future, and why the hell not? What is so bad about making some money, you know? I mean, I bet he claims his fees <laughs> and haggles over them. My God, <laughs> you bet. <laughs> Sharpest capitalist in the room. One of I them, anyway. <laughs> Disguised as a socialist. No, That's I, another conversation. I was actually, I, I was going on to say that in fact, within the society that we live in, Florence with its gills, I mean, the, you know, the, the gills for wool or for gold, or whatever, certainly didn't do it just for fun. Um, they actually saw a long term, certain long-term advantages in doing that as well. But going more to, um, to the times that we live in, I mean, you know, whether it's centre core, core or whether it's a Ford Foundation or whatever it may be, there are a series of buildings which have been built successfully. We have worked, and you know, I mean, most of us in this, I'm sure, room have worked for clients which realise that, that there is a long-term advantage in not just squeezing the minimum or giving the minimum. Yes, but uh, uh, squeezing the, the maximum. In, in this country, hasn't worked enough. No. Like this, that you can do well by doing good, you see. <coughs> but uh, which uh, they do abroad. I mean, maybe Paul Klimov is an uh, example of. Uh, <coughs> uh, who? Paul Klimov. Oh yes, absolutely. But it's not. It's not just the developer. He must be very careful. I mean, I'm just worried about the developer. I mean, we theoretically also have are meant to have the organisations which cr cr create the standards. We're meant to have better organisations in this country than practically any other country about creating aesthetic control, social control. We have councils which give tremendous with planning considerations, with all these things which are meant theoretically should make it that much easier for the architect design team with good intentions to be able to prove to his developer that if he goes along with him, you will get quicker returns, you won't be blocked by the local authority, the, you know, the neighborhood association, the GLC, Lambeth, Southwark, Houses of Parliament, a changing every two year government, and so on. So, theoretically, this wonderful. They should be able. So, all these wonderful controls should make us, the architect, going to go to the client and say, if you do this, we will get it through at half the time. Now let's face it, it's got damn all to do with cost. It's all to do with time. With rents as they are, to take an example in London, costs are practically secondary. £25 a square foot. All you have to do is to finish the building three months you know, later, and you really made a mess of it. Add 10% of the cost is neither here nor there. Um, so it's all about time. You have a wonderful weapon. The only thing is, we just throw it away. Not just this is not just the developer. This is the old, that's us. I mean, yeah, us in the sense of the somebody department. mentioned the word enlightened. Yeah, enlightened. Yeah. And whether that is that's missing somewhere. It is. It is. Well, maybe someone's got a view on you know why we don't have 
enlightened capitalism in this country because um, it has uh, achieved good things in America and absolutely no guise whatever of, um, uh, as Norman says, of, of sort of being public spirited or anything else. They've, they've done it and they've done jolly well out of it. And in Canada and, uh, well, and in Hong Kong. You can do it by law, can't you, by capital gain? Um, uh, but oh. by um, uh, uh, planning. You're rich. Yeah, exactly. Compulsory to do, to, you know, bribe people to do it. Yes, I think, think actually. Planning permission. Um, I think it all boils I, down to a diagram that Charles Eames did once in yes. three bubbles. Yeah. They're all occupied in different positions on the page. Mm. One bubble said, this, is, this area represents the interest of the client. And the second bubble said, this area represents the interest of the public. The third one was, the, this bubble represents the interest of the architect. And on that particular diagram, you know, they all overlapped each other a bit, but the, the area where all three overlapped was actually extremely small. But, um, I, mean, I think the, the problem with this country is a, a sort of compartmentalized mentality, and you know the clients think, you know, well, you know, uh, you know we're clients, we, we don't, we, you know, we have our own interests. But, are interests. Interests. but, but I think that the whole secret is to actually increase that area of overlap, you know, and just enlarge, enlarge the area of interest so that the, the actual bits where where the bubbles overlap become larger in area. Come on, Theo, don't just sit there no, grunting. It, 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 <laughs> I mean, the real point is that architects can sell anything. I mean, look at you, you sell that <coughs> to lawyers, you see, I mean, which is an amazing piece of salesmanship. I mean, there's no question about it. And, and see if it can sell anything too, you see, in another way. Now, I mean, it, it's perfectly clear that we have the architecture that architects have sold their clients. None of those things are, 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 are the client's fault at all. I mean, I've never ever found a client who was determined to have an ugly building. But that, that, I mean, I, I, I accept that, but um, I think that there are ways in which you can make a life, and I'm not talking about the client, I'm, I'm with the, the point that the client is not the, I won't say he's, he's not without blame, because there's good and bad patronage, and I don't. I have met, and I think we have all met clients. I won't actually quite accept that. Which make I have had clients which will make life so bloody difficult. It's hardly worth living. You might as well give it up. And I've had clients. Okay, if you like, I've had clients I can sell to, and clients I can't put it in your terms. Um, and so I call that, and those I can. It's good patronage. <laughs> and, um, but they are there for understanding. It's understand. There are understanding clients. But I also I don't think it's just a question of client by a long way. I think it's a very complex situation in which, first of all, there is, I think, a lack of dialogue within the profession to start with. There is a considerable lack of, therefore, there's little direction. I don't mean the whole profession, but even but from the profession who should be active. I think we're amazingly, I don't know quite why, we're scared to be active. So you there's, little, up, sorry, there's little leadership policy. You come up against uh, professionals who are in positions, uh, I would nearly say to dictate. Yes. And uh, I think the client is very often maligned because, uh, as the Theo said, you, know, you can sell uh, a client, you can convert him, and don't let's forget that the first step in good or bad architecture is the client step by choosing the architect. And that is a very important step, and he is not very uh, well informed yes. very often. And you get a it's bad good. client, and he, he, you can turn him into a good client. But he's fully informed. He's fully informed is a key word. Yes. For me, and, and only people who can inform him are those in this situation, I mean, it doesn't matter. Well, it's, it's, it's medicine, whatever it is. It's the information. But it's the information is supplied by those who are considered. I mean, you know, your, your, your Sunday Time Observer, whatever it is, writers, your 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 RIBAs, your your your, your Victorian societies. These are inf organisations with good <coughs> information and the public read. If those are all giving negative signals all the time and are not willing to 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 give positive signals of any sort. Then I think you've got a, 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 a society which doesn't know whether it's going left or right. I mean, I don't believe that suddenly in the, in, in the 16th, 15th century in Italy, so that suddenly all the clients 
if I may put it that way, suddenly recognized that they had a wonderful series of artists. And I don't think, you know, that, someone is, that everybody suddenly understood that Mas what Masaccio or Donatello or whatever it is was doing. I think what did happen though is that there was a tremendous relationship between a limited number of people who knew or felt they knew what was happening. And therefore, for all the pressures between Goldberti and Donatello, in the end they were in the same boat and recognized the goddamn situation and they were a lot better than the rest of the artists of that period, if you like. And therefore you start to get a situation where there was a recognition between the professionals which then was communicated. Now, some of those professionals were also the Medici, who could also write poetry and etc., etc. But in the first stages, there was a recognition by a number of people of what was good and what is bad. I don't think we any longer have that. And I think that is more important than what the client does, because the client is trying to pick up vibes, and the vibes is getting alone are all going in different directions. And I, I, I think the interesting comparison, let's say, Lloyd's on the one hand, where you have one client who knows what he wants and chooses an architect and uh, backs him up. Uh, you can get fine buildings still in this way, whether it's the Sainsbury Centre, where you have a, a, a person who is in sympathy with the architect. Um, when you come to a, a vast development where a developer dreams up a mix which contains elements, some of which are profitable and some of which are not, some of which are uh, of greater value to the, to the uh, people who live there and so on, then you're in dead trouble. It's an entirely different situation, I think. It can be, but, you know, let's just take, if I can take from a where this law is a coin street, take coin street for a minute. I mean, when I was called into coin street, basically yeah, what was there was a bath, I can't remember, three office blocks and one hotel. And somebody said, this will never get through, it's bloody awful. And we'll never get through the inquiry. The QC, as it happens at this point, as I understand it. He said, you know, you are, and the developer for Christ, I've got a problem on my hands. Someone actually managed to say it for a change. And so he then sort of looked around and said, well, okay, this guy is me. In this situation, he's never built any offices, but maybe he'll get us, win us an appeal. And then in that discussion, not for one is at that moment in quite some power, if I can put it that way. In other words, you can say, you know, I don't need it. I'm not going to have a headache <coughs> for nothing. So let's meet and talk. I mean, at that point, the architect, let's say the architect, like you say, it's a design team, it's not an architect, it's, a, it's an engineer, it's a quality of the whole design team. Um, by the way, which I think is a, could be a strengthening. I feel, it's a second discussion, but there is in England a possibility of a sort of professional sort of team which probably doesn't exist in most other countries, which if they don't, you get stuff to, together. But you're in a situation of power and you say, okay, Mr. Developer, I think we can get a bit more density on that site or plot ratio it is, if we do this, that and the other. Now the developer in the end <coughs> is making a very likely, in this sort of situation, to be making a very handsome profit indeed. He can afford to take some of the advice, not all possible, but most of the advice. Actually, I must say very little advice he doesn't take usually to take fits by advice. Because you can use the word sell it, analyze it, whatever it is, and say, look, if you do this, if you say, look, yes, offices are only really bad in these situations, but if you do these things, they become sort of better. But if but some of that profit, you know, the big game we have as architects and science is that you know, in simple terms, is to take some of the profit that he's making and put it where it helps the scheme work within a social structure. But that's not negative for the developer because he might, in a, in a, better, in a, a more well-organized society, he's more likely to get planning permission. Without planning permission, he can have dreams as much as he likes. Therefore, in a sense, the architect's role is one which he, of opening eyes, of discussing with the developer and explaining the advantages. And of course, I mean, you know, this is a very important role. And it's, it's, I think the worst problem we've got him doing, again, is that the architect in the end has, ends up as a messenger boy, and that is the worst level. The developer says, I want two million, and he does a sketch for two million. Square, whatever it is, feet, housing, offices, factory. At that point, he is just, you know, as I said, a messenger boy. He may, you know, he may be you know, a great name, but really, and that's what I asked, if there was any point in the, you know, to keep on. The question that one, one, the thing that one's really saying is, is the architect's role to question the brief. You see, the Kind Street story is very interesting. In that way. I mean, the 
business of the scheme being prepared and the council saying, this is nobody good, I can't get you a planning commission with this. They then went to you and you said, you know, maybe they were coming to me just to get them a planning commission. But well, maybe that was in their mind, but by exerting your power, as you call it, I mean, if they get, and it's only an outline permission they're after, not a detailed permission. If they do get a permission, they aren't going to get a permission in a vacuum that you are allowed to build X thousand square feet of offices. I mean, they're going to get a permission which is absolutely tied to your concept. But it's tied because, if you like, we I mean, forced it to be that way. That's right. What way you play the game? I'd, I'd, like, I'd like. It to, is a very yes, powerful. Situation. I'd like to pick up that and the point that that Nick started with when he used the word daring. Um, and I think that you could reinterpret the spirit of the point that Nick was um, was making by saying that one of the problems that I believe that we face as um, if one dissolves the image of the sort of the kingpin art artist sort of architect um, that we face as designers is that far too many people, whether they're clients or planners um, or officialdom or establishment or whatever, um, really want to be told. I mean, you know, they, they, they want to be given a very, very positive direction. And the problem is that nine times out of ten, I believe the role that the architect assumes is trying to find out what they want yeah. so that he can give it to them. <laughs> so that when somebody comes along and they say, you know, they, they, they have something to offer, then it's like a breath of fresh air. And actually, I mean, I've, it, you know, it's, 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 you know, I should be touching wood or, or, or something, but I mean, so far, I, we haven't had problems with planners. Now, you know, I mean, it's going to happen, um, and uh, I can think of odd sort of ripples around the odd blue building that shouldn't have been blue or something like that, although it all ended happily. But um, by and large, I mean, you know, those problems have not existed. I'm not suggesting, you know, that Rich is not having problems with planners, and I'm not <laughs> suggesting that sort of, you know, the coin street with the scale and so on. But I mean, it, the, you know, if, as I suspect, the sequel to the coin street uh, saga is, it, it, is that there's a certain sort of, you know, design strategy uh, established. It sure as hell won't be by going round to everybody and saying, what would you like? Oh, you know, I take a note of that. What would you like? Sure. And then sort of doing that for, you know, it will be because somebody's broken through that particular system where, you know, where people have become so accustomed to the architect being the lapdog. The key question actually you should never ask is what would you like, is what would you not like, by the way. I think that never. If you, you know, if you, they cannot yes. imagine what I mean, they will like. You, you, you can imagine only yeah. what they will not. I mean, in that sense, and it's very important. The architect is always asking, I can spend that point, asking, what do you want? That is not the question to ask continuously. It is actually, it is, what have you experienced which you do not, you have experienced which you do not like? I have experienced the certain things that you do not have, and vice versa. If your starting point, you know, is, is you for developing a design, what will get planning permission? You know, what do the planners want? You've had it. I mean, it's, you know, it, it comes all the way back to when you're a student. You know, if you started doing your 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 thesis and designing as you went along, um, you had it. if you hadn't actually got a sort of hard cover <coughs> to respond to, um, <coughs> well, there are two segments to what we're calling the planners. I mean, you know that the professional planners in the country have, in fact, sold it to. Them most of them, but it is by speaking. the technique you're saying, not mm -hmm. that they then bloody <laughs> say so, because the other side <laughs> of the is, is the politicians and all that shit. And I mean, there are professional planners having to professionally object to your scheme and giving evidence, and you know. But, they, but that is a weak, you know, that's a weak, I mean, I find that still, though, Gordon, very and this is upsetting. You can't. I mean, I mean, well, you know, I mean, I know you do too. You know, in the end, what one has got is a whole series of professional people with considerable capability who, are, after yeah. February the twenty mm. first or whenever the election was, were all saying it's fine, it's great, it's fantastic. It's the first thing is it, and on February the twenty second, they were saying, oh, Christ, right. well, we've got an election, and the wrong party <laughs> got in, and maybe it's not as good as that. And yes, you know, I've been twenty five years in this game, and you just have to wait another twenty five years, Richard, and you'll be all right. <laughs> and you think, Fuck you, what the hell? <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> well, you know, it's not something you generalize. I don't know how you speak to generalize about national characteristics. Um, but is there an antipathy <laughs> against um, uh, 
formalism in the city. I mean, do, do the English fear the city? I'm, I'm thinking that the, you know, the last bit of formal planning, um, I'm right, reminded about formal planning and seeing these sort of galleries and things like that, it was Kingsway. And I always enjoy going around Australia House and things like that. And I always feel a bit guilty because I'm always told in the books, you know, that you shouldn't like um, that. There's something wrong. But I rather like the Beaux-Arts and the formal. Um, I rather like the sort of, um, well, the, you know, uh, these, these formal structural elements in the city. But it seems to me that the English have somehow have been told to fear them. And is this real? I'd say, are we justified in, uh, are they justified in fearing uh, the grandiose, the, you know, the, the formal uh, urban state? Or is this all <laughs> Uh, I think what I would like to ask you is uh, that if you had a free hand and uh, politics aside and money aside, what do you think should be put on the current street site? I mean, let's face it, um, office, putting office blocks there is a way of financing something or other, and then you put something in as a sop to uh, the people there. But uh, that is a, a very bad start. What do you actually think, if, if you had a free hand and it didn't matter, what should be there? What is the right... It's a question which I'm morally often asked. I was putting that. The problem with that question, I may put it that way, is that it's a bit like saying, if I, um, and we were asked, when people came to us when we had sort of completed Boburg and said, will you build us a Boburg in the uh, Middle East? And the problem is that the question, the, the brief has changed, the situation has changed. And of course, you know, Boburg as it is, isn't quite the same as if it is in Mecca or whatever it is. Um, and in the sense that it, you, 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 by saying, ah, I have taken the capitalist element, if I can put it that way, which is the financial element out of it, what would you put there? You're really changing the whole structure. It's like you're changing the site. It's no longer on the Thames, it's in, in a desert. Um, you mean you'd have to have gold ducks? Well, you, well, I mean, you know, we're often saying this, sort of joking, we say, if, the, if you know, Maggie Thatcher phoned through like, you know, a bit like Tondra and said, here's 100 million quid, well, the, the rules of the game would be changed. Mm. At, at that point, you may well argue, well, you know, maybe we could build more offices in the city or whatever it is, on the Hammersmith or wherever you like to put it, because with 100 million quid, which you've just been given, or 200 million pounds, there are other things which, because after all, you can't really argue that any offices can only go in Coin Street. You can argue perfectly well that offices can go in Coin Street, you can argue that they can go, I don't know, Victoria Street, I'm just sort of saying that you can go, they can, certainly you can go, a hell of a lot of offices could go to the east of the city without sort of destroying the city. Um, so now once you've taken out that sort of whole, a major part of that, of that, of the brief, which is that it's got to be financially viable, which is... That's a very artificial thought. Well, no, it's not. It's, yeah, it's, it's, I, I it's only an artificial... To respond to a, a no, piece of land. No, it's not an artificial... No, but how do you... What is a piece of land? A piece of land is made... I mean, if you're saying to me... I mean, it didn't happen with Boeberg. I mean, no way did it happen with Boeberg. I mean, quite honestly, if if Pontridge's question was, here is 100 million pounds, do what you like, I assure you I wouldn't have come up with a cultural centre. doesn't mean the cultural centre is wrong there, but I... You know, I mean, it, it, it's a different problem. You'd be starting to examine... The, first of all, you'd examine exactly the locality and so on, and you'd probably come up with all, a totally different situation. I'm not sure that... Yes, it would be better at one... Maybe it would be better at one level, I mean, at the level that you have taken out one element. But it is a, a different question. The point I'm making is that, in the end, in this situation, just like the site is on a river, the site also has to be financial. I mean, therefore, they has to take context of a river, a cultural centre, a station, uh, a north bank, and so on. Um, so, and, uh, you know, King's Reach, which we haven't discussed, and so on. Um, so, at the same point, it also has to take a society, which is also 1980. I mean, you could argue what would happen if you were thought of it in 1880. I mean, what would happen if you could transport yourself 100 years back? What would you do? Or what would happen if, you, I had as I said, you know, you won the football pool, but what would happen if, so, if, in this situation, one of the rules, the principal rules of the game is, it's got to be financially viable, because at the moment, and this is, I think, perfectly fair, at the moment, it seems dubious whether a government who cannot, at the moment, supply milk for its children should be investing money in Coin Street. I think there is a, quite a, a definite positive question. I don't mean they should invest no money uh, in, in, in the sense that, you know, I think it's a situation of housing, the situation is possibly of, of a number of things, but I think it would be dubious at this point where, as I said, I'm just, you know, where you know, schools are closing, where, 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 where there is sort of 
poverty, where there's lack of so on, to suddenly for the government to say, right, sure, we can't Lambeth, we can't finance Lambeth schemes which are half up, Southwark schemes which are half up, let alone any other body else. I mean, their building is actually stuck, you know, with without windows, which only need windows to be finished, but there's not money. So at that point, for the government suddenly <coughs> to say, but you know, after all, we can throw you know a hundred million pounds here, which is a sort of two hundred million pounds. I think that would be a highly dubious political question. We're not looking for that sort of money. What we're saying is that within the structure, and I'm not going to discuss this normal, you know, you know, socialism versus capitalism or, or, or anarchism. Um, we'll do that the next time. Uh, <laughs> but at this point, within the structure, we've got, I see no reason for not. I would not change the balance. Probably the sort of things that I might change, not with money, but with an argument is, I think that probably the plot ratio is if anything too low. That is a that's a different situation. Plot ratio means that I think I would prefer to put more offices on there for greater public return, for instance. I don't see why, for instance, where we're we're working at I mean, somewhere around two point four to one. Somewhere would, between. Would, would I think I would prefer to work at three to one. Well and increase the quality of the goodies. Exactly. Do you think the sort of availability of cheap communications or telecommunications or whatever might sort of alter your opinion about how many, how many people I, should work in offices? But I'm not. I'm one of the people who believe doesn't. Believe, and when I say I'm one, I'm also I must say within most, with a lot of people believe that actually offices are on their way out. I actually think um, that offices are on their way in. If you like, yes. there are different former offices. But the actual major effect, as far as I, I would take, there's two things. First of all, I wouldn't like the rest of try to say before to guess where we're going to be in 30 years' time. Every time, you know, with lawyers, we said, you know, when we had these sort of interviews, we said, they say, well, let's look at the future 75 years ago, and on that year, it was actually just 50 years back that the, the first, that the, 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 the first uh, uh, plane had crossed the Atlantic. So, you know, that's only 50, now 53 years back. In other words, it's impossible to imagine from 53 years that where we would be on the moon and, you know, in the universe. So it's impossible to see that far forward. But having said that, and having said that all that we can do is to create structures which, which could be changed, so therefore if those who say there will be no offices are right, we can adapt those structures. Mm. Having said that, I doubt whether in the immediate future we will be seeing less offices. I think we will be seeing less industrial, and we will see a, a greater effect on an industry probably with, with the microchip than we will in the amount of offices. We'll see a change in the way of work, the type of work in offices, but I suspect mm. that the service industries will still be there. Mm. And I was just thinking that, you know, to actually get all, all those to get to actually get the number of people to fill a million square feet of offices, you actually need a very big transport network, and transport well, seems to be getting or surface transport anyway. So can I just say, in London we have expensive. approximately 190 million square feet, and it sure is beyond me to work out whether 191 is more too much or too little. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's it, and you know, it's it's too fine a point. In other words, I don't. I, I'm not saying that the planet should, but it is. We, a major component of the discussions we've had on <coughs> Coin Street has been trying to work out the effects on an increase in birth rate between 2.2 .2 per family to 2.3. And I, apart from unbelievable amount of money being put into this goddamn argument, I feel in the end it really is totally unimportant. Maybe it should be, I don't, I don't, you know, it depends upon the success of the scheme, whether it should be 1 million two or 1 million or 900 mm -hmm. million. Um, and all I can say at that point is that it, it all you can do is create a structure where it could change, it could exactly. adapt, it could be that we will have some more flats into, into it. And if we haven't built the last speed, then we will, maybe the last speed, whatever the last speed is in the middle, whatever it is, maybe it should be, it should be a housing. Great, you know, no problem. I think if we're not careful, and you know, Gordon made this point before, that if we're not careful, if we start to think, you know, you can just imagine sort of a few hundred years ago in the times of the cathedrals, thinking, Jesus Christ, a cathedral takes 200 years. Forget it. I mean, by 200 years, there won't be any religion. Any religion. <laughs> I mean, you know, um, we can't start this game. <laughs> I mean, now, we must be a bit careful that you know we don't sort of perpetuate a form of negativism. It doesn't mean that we should no, jump in. It, it seems a very bad basis to do a major development. To say, in order to do it at all, we must have offices. Because no, you must have economic. What economic. Would you do? If that, that is the way to finance it, and you must have housing because that is the way we get it through planning. I mean, it's oh, I yeah. say that. You say that. <laughs> well, I mean, that, that's true, isn't it? Yeah. I didn't say that. What would you do? Well, yeah, yeah, I asked Richard, he, he can't stop being a realist, you see. I, I hope he could respond to a hypothetical question, uh, whether what, what is being done 
I love question that you are doing. What is possible under the circumstances? I was hoping you would say what. What do you think would be nice to do? You know whether it's possible or not. And, and well, you went back to say, well, things being what they are. No problem with providing <laughs> nice offices for people to work. But in. people are not crying out for offices. Uh, yes, there are twenty-five yeah. pounds a square foot. There must be yeah. thirty pounds a square foot. Of course there are. I would have a jolly good office site. It's next to a station. Just I can defend the offices, but, I, but it doesn't answer your question. In other words, I can argue there is a perfectly good office site, as Gordon is saying. I believe that in relation to the, to the points that we've made, it is, a, or it is already the, has been for a long time, the, the third largest conglomeration of offices. I mean, the city of Victoria, I think basically because the city of the, the, the Victoria development, and then the South Bank. Therefore, there is already, we're not creating a new foot. Print, though you could argue why not, but anyhow, in that situation, in other words, it exists. Having said that, I can think of nothing, nothing, no other <coughs> instrument which will give us the potential for enriching that part of London that yeah, is. Apart wondering. from offices, I can't think. If you say I'll put housing there, with an excuse, I'm not. First of all, let me, if you're asking me, would you I put housing, only housing answers, no, because I don't think it is a, a local site. I see housing as basically being local. It's, in its nature. I would put mixed uses, whatever happens. But out of housing, I can't, we can't put mixed uses because they can't pay. The rent of housing is, you know, very few pounds, whilst the rent of offices is, is, in, you know, is in the teens and twenties nowadays. The way. So therefore, we can't put this, we can't put the bridge across, we can't link it through, we can't put the sunken and Pierce and so on, therefore, and anyhow, the acres and acres of land which where you can put housing on as well, where, where, around, where you couldn't put this form of office or organization, office organization which will pay for these goods. And, I do, and sure, a brief which I haven't considered could be, and I can sort of, you know, what would you put in fact, I suppose, the A has actually been working on, anyone the A here? Uh, the A has been working on the Coin Street side, I won't see it until Friday, and I suspect the brief probably was, do what you like, I should be interested to see what they have done with do what you like on it. It's a very difficult brief. Well, there's, there's no sports centre in the centre of the Yes, there is a form of, yes, there is a area where you can do some sport, but, you know, you could also argue that, if I may put it that way, that who is going to run the sports centre in an area which is just pressed with a lot of empty ground already? The most likely people to run a sports centre are probably office workers. I'm now quickly coming to uh, <laughs> responding. I think it's one The argument about office, you know, what would you like there, is a really ridiculous argument because you have no choices. So it's like this tennis, but but What you do have, I mean, and if I might put oh. a slightly negative view here, which I know you've probably had enough of today. That's I find the scheme is very interesting in its way, but I find it very big, you see, and it's all the same. That's the bit that bothers me most, really, is that it hasn't got all that rich visual uh, architecture which we actually like in, uh, in old towns, and which you pointed out at length, you see, as being uh, what is nice, you see. For instance, Florence, it's nice. I mean, I absolutely adore Florence, and all the buildings are about 20 foot wide, you know. And then you go on to another building by another architect, who's preferably some 20 years or 100 years or 200 years later. You know, so that you're in a kind of what you might call a mental matrix of time and, and variety and opportunity. And you know, you can see yourself in a way coming along into this place, not actually wiping all down and knocking in half a mile of new building in Florence. I mean, the idea of that is obscene. You're not forgetting but skills. Yeah, but that's what I'm talking about. Though, well, well, I mean, if it's Gary and Annie, about one eighth of one of his little beats. But the opposition was about the same as you obviously hear from the side. Richard, uh, Richard, 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 Richard gave the example of Regent's Park, which is. Well, really Nash does. Nash, 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 Nash is the classic. Yes, Nash is the classic. Really good. Yeah, I know these arguments, you see, but I mean, what you're talking about is the city, and Regent's Park is a park. No, no, Regent Street. Now, Reaper Street also consists of lots of little buildings. Oh, come on, Phil. <laughs> you who study little. Right Regent Street from the air is one good, simple wall. Okay. Now, at okay. ground level, boy, we've done this. Yeah. Gordon and I have gone through this a few times. At ground level, it is full of holes. From the aerial view, it can only be recognized as a continuous space going around certain points. A, a, a continuous space roughly three miles long, which puts our 400 yards looking like child's play. Also built sort of 200 years ago. Um, it depends, if I can really put it that way. I don't think you can argue 
I don't believe it. You can argue it is so much too big or too small, but you can argue is it appropriate or not for that specific brief and place. Uh, I don't, you know, you can, it's difficult to argue whether in Paris where you have the boulevards, they are all wrong. I'm not a great lover of the boulevards, I must say, but I also think that some of them are tremendously successful and some of them are less successful. Um, there are vast planning schemes which have been, you know, Dubrovnik, to take an example. Dubrovnik, just, you know, which I know you know well, is a town which is made out of one, practically one single house throughout. I don't think you can argue it's too big, yet there must be, what should we guess, 5,000, 10,000 units there, all the same? Uh, Colonial uh, cities throughout history. really all the same. See, the thing about, <clears throat> about going along a street is really that you have a lot of what I would have preferred, if you're going to talk about an ideal arrangement, <laughs> would be a strategy for employing 25 different architects rather than one. That'll help me. Very good idea. <laughs> I mean, yes, but I, I mean, what's the date on your uh, life? Uh, uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> Leather France, as Norman says, is a, is a classic example. I think England is a classic example. I think Oxford Street, which is probably the worst street I can think of, is an absolute typical example of that philosophy. I think Oxford Street is a disaster street. I cannot think of a less successful major city street in any city I know. It is an example of total lack of confidence at every single level. Specifically by planners who are obviously going wrong, around saying, I haven't got confidence, we'll make it a small building by A, B, small being, you know, small in plan, and God give me Regent Street any time. I think it's my job at this point to direct people towards food. But I, I, I must say, I, I seem to remember in some time in the past, Theo doing one of the biggest megaliths of all time uh, in, in, in Fulham, which sort of crept over the top of things and wound all over the place. Um, one thing I would like to say, though, just coming back to right, right, right to the beginning, uh, and, and also the, the fact of something else Theo said about people don't ask their architects to do bad buildings for them. And I think it's a, it's a very nice point, that, actually. And I think that uh, I was raising the question of daring originally. But I think that, I don't know whether it's the fact we've got far too many architects in England. I mean, that's another, that's another, another discussion, I'm sure. But, uh, and, and the fact that most of them are broke, or whatever. But um, I think there is a, um, an issue where you can swing it right back onto you know, on to all of us here, that you, you've actually got to be prepared to, you know, really uh, risk a lot to get something good up. And um, I think um, certainly Richard's done it. I know Norman has. I mean, in, in, in the last, in quite a, a recent period of a few years, they both, their offices have been down to very few people, simply because they, you know, weren't prepared to kind of muck about and do any old thing. They, they thought they wanted to do what they wanted to do, and uh, they were prepared to fight for it. And I think, you know, there's a, there's a lot... I think the profession is extremely negative in that respect, myself. And you don't, you know, people don't... Uh, they, they, they do exactly what, what uh, uh, I think Richard was saying, that, that you know, you, you kind of spend this endless kind of process of winkling out of the client what you think they might like, you know. You're totally sort of, um, in a sense, negative in the approach that, that uh, and, and so sort of <coughs> give them um, this sort of a feeling of, of, um, um, of omnipotence, which they probably then, um, you know, probably leads them into this sort of uh, uh, this track where they feel they actually can, uh, uh, where where they really do abuse their power. And I mean, I think that uh, in, in in respect of office architects particularly, that's got to the most appalling degree. I mean, uh, uh, Richard's got into a marvellous position of actually have finding a, and if, if you like, an enlightened developer. But I mean, there are kind of six firms of architects um, which every developer will go to first before us if they've got an office block to do. And I think that's an extremely depressing Situation. Can I tell you one funny story? Um, uh, well, well, <coughs> do. <laughs> uh, at the time on the Lloyds thing, when, when the short list of people to be considered was published, and there were three British firms, one was Richard, one was Norman, and I was doing an important place, and when that was published, 
I had several letters, and I'm sure the chairman of Lloyd's had similar letters, from the six firms you're talking about, or some of them, saying clearly there has been some mistake. I mean, these things happen in the best regulated offices. But, I mean, Rogers and Foster haven't built a building in the city of London between them. They haven't built anything more than five stories high between them. Now, you know that, I mean, I mean I've done 12 blocks in, in London. I mean, I've got the experience. I mean, they were actually doing that. And I'm sure they were doing it to Lloyd's, and I've no real evidence of that. And the real bravery of Lloyd's at that situation was to tear those letters up and, and press on with characters like this. Hmm. That is another aspect of the uh, negative aspect of the way the profession often behaves on, on several scales. Right? Whenever you get a protest about it, even the smallest little local scheme, you'll always find that some bloody architect's actually leading it. That should be the next meeting here, actually. That would make a good meeting. It would be a great meeting here, the next one. That would make a nice meeting. The meat building. Yes. Yeah. I think it would be a yeah, great meeting. Who's going to be meat? <laughs> 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 Who's going to be meat? 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 Who's going to be the protesters? I mean, the, the lead, lead the protesters. Oh, well, we can, we can dig those up. <laughs> Maybe Theo. Yeah. 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 You might have to find them. Yeah. 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 Yeah.